The GH5 is a great camera, we have used it in several jobs. The GH6 is the successor. This is the official presentation of B. With all the specifications. Translated in very languages activating the subtitle icon. It's kind of hard to wrap my mind around some of the features crammed in here. A brand new 25.2 megapixel sensor, 5.7K video up to 30 FPS, 4K video up to 120 FPS, and perhaps most exciting of all, the GH6 records ProRes internally to CF Express Type B cards. Filmmakers are gonna love it, and for photographers, new and enhanced processing on the GH6 produces cleaner, more vibrant photos, and it can even shoot up to 75 FPS continuously. But that's barely scratching the surface here. The GH series has always been a really exciting line, and each camera has brought at least one, if not a few, killer features. First off, the GH6 brings a new level of performance to the Micro Four Thirds format with dynamic range improvements, significantly better low light performance, and 5.7K capture with internal ProRes recording. Based around a new 25.2 megapixel sensor and equipped with the latest Venus engine, the processing power here is constantly on display. With demanding features like the aforementioned 4K video at 120 FPS, 75 FPS burst photos, 100 megapixel high resolution mode that can actually be used handheld, and a 5.8K open gate mode, there's little that the GH6 can't do. Naturally, we had the chance to get our hands on one, so we put it through some tricky indoor environments to see just how capable this camera really is. Join me in the classroom. All right, welcome back to class, everyone. Today, we're taking a look at the brand new Panasonic Lumix GH6. 5.7K internal ProRes recording is huge on its own, but we also have 4K at 120 FPS and overall massive improvements to low light sensitivity and dynamic range that I'm sure in an eclectic space like this, it's going to look phenomenal. So let's get started. 5.7K recording is pretty wild, especially on a Micro Four Thirds sensor. 4K picture quality on the GH5 was already superb, but if there was an area to improve upon when it came to picture quality, it was in low light performance and dynamic range. If you've used the GH5 or similar, you'll probably recognize a lot of what's going on in here. The menus haven't changed significantly, but there are some new features that really define how you use the camera, how you expose for it, and of course the codecs and resolutions, frame rates that you choose. There's a ton of options here. I cannot stress that enough. Um, right now, I've already got this set up for ProRes 5.7K uh, internal recording to CF Express cards. Um, you can see here, even on a 512 card, we just have almost 42 minutes, so you don't get a lot even for that kind of card. Um, we'll talk about codecs and recording later though. So first, what I want to show you is if we go into the menu, we are currently using what's called the dynamic range boost function. This is basically taking a high and low gain version of the signal from the sensor, combining that to get the most dynamic range out of the sensor possible. This is actually only usable at 4K up to 60 FPS or 5.7K up to 30 FPS. And the camera will limit your resolutions and frame rates if this mode is on. So it won't necessarily give you a warning, but it will just prohibit you from switching into settings that aren't compatible with it. So right now we have it on. And what that actually does is it changes in V-Log and HLG, it changes our base ISO to 2000. Even when that mode's on, if you're not in V-Log or in HLG, you're at base 800. And if you have the mode off, you're also in base 800. So it's a little complicated. You have to rethink your exposure a little bit, but it does mean that you start much higher. And 2000 actually gives you the most latitude in those profiles when you have this mode engaged. So right now, uh, I'm keeping it at 2000. I've closed my iris just a bit to try to get a good mix of highlights and shadows here. Um, you can see we have some light coming in through the window over there. So I'm curious to see how that's handled in post when we start bringing things down a bit. And uh, we also have some shadows against the wall and the bookcase here. So a little mix of everything. So I'm just gonna give a little quick pan to this and roll on it and We'll see how that looks. It's shots like these where I found highlight roll off to be far superior to the GH5. The windows here have a reasonable level of bloom. They're still bright, of course, while specular highlights hit the globe just right. Classrooms really haven't changed since I was in school. 
Fine detail can be tricky on cameras because of course, if they don't have an optical low pass filter like the GH6 doesn't, that means that it presents a risk for things like moiré, aliasing, things like that. You get a little bit sharper of an image compared to a traditional sensor that may have that filter. Since it has new, improved Venus engine processing, a lot of the work that's gone into it has been to improve fine edge detail, uh, shimmering, moiré, things like that, that could crop up when you lack an optical low pass filter. So uh, I wanna see how it is in these really finely textured surfaces. And it does a fantastic job as both video and stills look smooth and crisp, even on fine detail and edges. This is huge for densely detailed scenes that can be problematic without an OLPF. The GH6 handles these no problem, as you can see here with the bust and the back wall of the shelf. I miss overhead projectors. There's something quaint about them. But what I wanted to see was how the GH6 handles really bright, intense sources in very high contrast situations. And this is obviously one of them. So I wanted to see what we could pull down and post. We're dealing with 10-bit ProRes footage here, which means we should have a decent amount of leeway to pull things down and still retain good highlight information overall. So we've changed rooms, and as you can see ahead of me, this room is kind of oddly spacious and yet narrow at the same time. There's a lot of practical lights cramped in here, a lot of detail going on, and overall there's just a ton of stuff to capture. And that means it's a great use case for the GH6's open gate or anamorphic mode. Now we don't have any anamorphic lenses here, but the mode is the same no matter what you use. So the open gate mode is just the 5.8K mode of the GH6, which is actually the highest resolution mode available on the camera. And it takes up the entire vertical space of the sensor, so you get a 4.3 image. So let's go through anamorphic setup. I've actually done a few changes already, which I'll walk you through. Uh, so basically, we are right now still in 5.7K, but we're not in the ProRes mode. We are actually in the compressed um, MOV mode. So you'll notice that my runtime here is three hours. I've also bumped the ISO to 6400. Uh, so this test is gonna double as a low light test. Ahead of me is very, very dimly lit. So right now uh, we're gonna stick with that and see how we fare, um, but I'll climb if I have to. So for anamorphic setup, we're gonna go right into the menu. Um, and then we're gonna go into here. You see I've already switched it to MOV and record quality down here brings us to all of our codec options. And there are tons of them and you can see there's 10 pages of codec options. Not all of them are accessible to us right now, but I'll walk you through those in a bit. Right now what I wanna tell you about is the display filtering. So this helps you a lot with trying to determine uh, what you need out of the vast array of options you have. So for this, of course, we're gonna go into resolution and the resolutions also list the ratios. In this case, we're looking for four three ones. So we have two options, the 5.8K and the 4.4K. Now the 4.4K is interesting because it actually only operates in 48 and 60 FPS, uh, whereas the 5.8K operates only up to 30 FPS. So for the sake of this, we're just gonna go with 5.8K. Um, and then you'll see there's only two results. So we'll hit OK, and that confirms we have two results. I'm gonna do the 24P option. All the specs are here. It does say anamorphic. Uh, that does not mean that it does any kind of de-squeezing or anything. By default, you have to enable that separately, so don't worry about that. Uh, so now you can see we have this 4-3 picture, um, and I can actually see the um, floor and I actually wanna see how much of this I can see. Yeah, I mean, we got some of the ceiling here some of the floor. I'm gonna just focus up on that real quick and we'll roll. And so we can see what this looks like. Now remember this is ISO 6400. So let's just do a quick tilt here. All right, so now let's move on to, uh, just out of curiosity, I wanna see how this fares all the way up to 12,800. So we're doubling essentially. Um, I mean, so far on the screen, it looks pretty good. Uh, we'll see how clean it is in reality. So we'll roll on that. Shooting a little bit more of this video wall here in the open gate mode. I love this thing, isn't it crazy? The video produced by this mode is simply stunning, especially if you're used to the ISO limitations of the GH5. Shadows are clean, and the low light sensitivity overall is almost as good as a GH5S. 
you can comfortably shoot up to, I'd say, about 6400. And as long as you have the DR boost enabled, even 12,800 is pretty good for the darkest situations. When it's disabled, things do get a little noisier, so keep that in mind. Regardless, it's a massive improvement and dramatically changes how you expose and light for the camera. All right, so here's a little more low light testing. You'll notice we actually have the face detect autofocus going on right here. Um, and this is not a fair situation, believe me. This is incredibly dark right now. You can see I still have my ISO cranked all the way to 12,800. Um, and yet it does manage to, to grab his face. Uh, Nick, if you could just walk off frame for a bit and then walk back in. You can see I lost him when he turned. Uh, come back in and sit back down. Yeah, it grabs him pretty quickly, actually. That, that's, that's actually really good to know, especially at this kind of exposure. Um, and I'm, again, I'm very curious to see uh, what we see here in terms of uh, low light noise. Um, I do see, even on the monitor here, some flicker from the lights. So that's not the sensor, that's definitely the lights actually spilling in from here too on the sides. We had those CRT televisions over there. Okay, here's a close up. Uh, again, keeping the same 12,800. So can you move around a little bit for me just so I could see how this captures your face? There we go, see? It does auto detect the face pretty reliably. I think this is honestly not a fair situation. We're gonna try this in a brighter room just to really get an idea of real world performance here. But still, again, this is really good to see. So I have here the Zacuto GH6 cage. If any of you have used cages before, you know that these are great for adding accessories, monitors, and we are gonna add a little more. We have some grips for these, some rails. So now the GH6 improves on the GH5's legendary dual IS2 stabilization. That was of course an in-body stabilizer that worked in concert with optically stabilized lenses like the one we have here. Now I wanna keep the rig pretty bare bones for now for that reason so that I don't lean too much on the rigs. I will add a few more things to this in just a bit. But for now, with handheld motion, I want to see how good the stabilization really is. Look like you, you're, you know, you want their attention, but you just are like maybe about to raise your hand. All right, go for it. Raise your hand. Swing it around like, you know, you're like, oh, exactly, exactly. Like before, the in-body stabilizer also corrects for lenses without their own optical stabilizers, but it does work best when used with lenses that do have their own optical stabilizers. Autofocus on the GH6 sees improvements all around, though it is still the DFD system on board here. Now, it's only fair to actually test it, and with 315 AF points this time around, and the fastest processing yet, it is worth checking out. Okay, so what we see here is both the face detect working and the stabilization working. So right now I have dual IS2 enabled, so there's optical stabilization provided by the lens, along with body stabilization provided by the camera body. And uh, right now, you know, I'm zoomed all the way in here at 100 millimeters on this lens. Now, one thing I did notice is that it's a little less um, helpful during tilt transitions. So like right here, for example, you can see as I'm tilting down, it's fighting my tilt. Um, and I did make sure that boost was disabled there's none of the other stabilization features in here. As I land on the shot here of the hand, um, and I keep it pretty static, again, the motion is really smooth. It counters a lot of shake. So I'm gonna do a handheld camera move here. I'm gonna follow Nick over here, out from one desk and into the other. That'll be his mark. And I just wanna see if one, it keeps up with the focus, so especially once he hits the mark, if it uh, picks up his face again, and also how good the stabilization is. Now remember, I do have the cage here, but this is still all handheld. You're writing, you're writing, okay. You're gonna be sent off in just a sec. You're having a confrontation, and you're, you're done, you're done, come on, out. All right, I'm gonna follow. And land right at the desk here. Face and eye detection is remarkably accurate in the GH6, and the camera does detect these features in a human face very quickly, as shown on the live view. But from my experience, at least, the camera wasn't refocusing as fast as it actually recognized the faces. That said, the GH6 does feel a lot better overall when it comes to focus hunting and staying locked onto a subject. I had much more success with the GH6 in staying on a subject, even in low light, and the touch to focus was also very accurate. Time for a class lesson. So, the GH6 has a ton of frame rate options, and some of them overlap with one another. So for example, there's an HFR and a VFR mode. Those stand for high frame rate and variable frame rate mode, respectively. Now, the highlight feature is the 4K 120, and it looks fantastic. The 4K 120 mode is a native frame rate, which is a key difference for the high frame rate 
category. High frame rate actually means that it has audio, it plays back at the recording rate. So I like to call that a native frame rate. And it has a, a particular maximum here. In this case, it is 4K at 120 FPS or full HD 1080p at 240 FPS. So you gain all of the normal benefits of recording normally. That means you have sync sound with it, which is obviously very important if you want to shoot that way. Um, VFR, on the other hand, variable frame rate is a different mode. And so what this allows you to do is record internally at a higher rate and then automatically playback at a slower playback rate. So that's why I'm calling it a different playback rate. Uh, of course, there's no audio with this because it's essentially out of sync with what's really going on. Now in HD, you actually have a little bit of an advantage here because there's no audio being recorded. There is just enough processing power left over that the camera is actually able to eke out 300 FPS, even though the maximum on the HFR side is 240. So in this, you can get the fastest rate possible on the camera. Now, the other nice thing about all of these modes, unlike on the GH5, uh, where the VFR modes necessitated 8-bit recording, that's no longer the case here on the GH6. The GH6 is almost entirely a 10-bit camera. In fact, you can't actually shoot in 8-bit on the GH6 unless you use MP4 container recording. So it's strictly a 10-bit camera for the most part. Some of these formats do require you to drop from 422 to 420, but if you're not doing any kind of graphical compositing or things like that, it's probably not gonna be that big of a deal for you. I want to capture the chalk writing in slow motion. Uh, now there's a few ways we can go about this. I could just shoot 120 natively, but for the sake of explanation, we're gonna do this with the proper VFR mode. So right now I'm in ProRes, I gotta get out of that. Go to the menu, switch this to MOV, and that brings us to the majority of our uh, recording options. Now, I actually need to look down here. I'm gonna choose on for variable frame rate. It gives me 18 results. Um, so I have a few options here that can all do VFR. Now, what this doesn't tell you is how high you can go up on the VFR in that mode. So for example, 5.7K here is not gonna be able to hit 120. If I drop down to 4K right here, 24, I actually have to drop down to 420 to do this. So I'm gonna go to that. You can see I already have it on here and we're at 60. Now, I know why this is the case. This is because I have the dynamic range boost on. So I'm gonna turn that off, go back down to variable frame rate, and then now I have all the way up to 120. So remember, DR boost doesn't work beyond 60, and that does include variable frame rates. So I'm gonna punch in on that, and now we are shooting effectively at 120. So um, I'm gonna crank the exposure just a bit to compensate for the loss of light here. So we're actually gonna go all the way up to 6400 just because I can, and I'll record on that. VFR follows a playback frame rate, so the video is already playing back in slow motion when you watch it over. The GH6 has far more VFR modes than the GH5 did, but the fastest frame rate is the 1080p 10-bit 420 mode that can go all the way to 300 FPS. Now, at 300 FPS, you can capture fascinating moments that happen in the blink of an eye in real life. As a VFR mode, the 300 FPS option lacks audio recording, and yes, the DR boost must be turned off in order to shoot above 60 FPS. Oh, and one more big note for video. This is the first time a GH series camera has had the full V-Log and V-Gamut on board. And yes, it's included. No separate purchase required here and no more V-Log L. So as you can see, I've got here a complete Zacuto rig on the GH6. On top of the cage and top handle that we used before, I now have a complete shoulder rig assembly with rails, a right handle grip, an arm here going to the Zacuto ACT EVF monitor, which looks great by the way. Now this is actually lighter than you would expect. Um, I don't feel this too much on my shoulder and it adds a lot more stability, even on top of the stabilizer we have in here. Uh, so great for kind of the kind of handheld cinema work you might wanna do. Um, we're gonna walk around here, test it around a bit, and then we're out of here. And action.
The GH6 is also a powerful stills camera, as all the improvements in processing benefit the still side greatly. The new 25.2 megapixel sensor produces incredibly sharp images, which is no surprise, honestly, given the lack of an optical low pass filter. And yes, here too, you can see improvements to edge detail and denoising that make for fantastic out of camera images. You can, of course, shoot raw, but the JPEG engine here does have its benefits. Continuous shooting on the GH6 goes all the way up to 75 FPS with the electronic shutter, single shot autofocus, and auto exposure or up to 8 FPS with a mechanical shutter and continuous focus. Plus, there are time-lapse and interval modes here, and even one focused on stop-motion animation. The Venus engine improvements also help the GH6's 100 megapixel high resolution mode. This mode has been around on previous Lumix cameras, but the processing is dramatically improved here, to the point where you can use the 100 megapixel mode handheld in certain situations. Previously, it was required to use a tripod for this, as the camera is effectively stitching together eight different exposures. The GH6 improves the high-res mode by adding a special handheld toggle. In practice, this actually works surprisingly well on things like landscapes and even fairly static street photography. It's not gonna work on moving subjects, but if you can hold it pretty steady, you won't need a tripod anymore. So we have lots to talk about when it comes to recording spec. Not only are there a multitude of resolutions and frame rates for you to choose from, but there's even different intro modes based on the card you're using, the ProRes modes, and the various configurations for HFR, VFR, and DR boost modes. I'm not gonna list every single option available, but I'm gonna cover some key formats and the most important caveats you need to keep in mind. Let's cover the top end first. ProRes is available here in both its HQ and standard 422 varieties, and it's used only for the 5.7K formats up to 30 FPS. ProRes is also only recordable to the CF Express slot, which makes sense given that HQ at 30 FPS has a 1.9 gigabit per second data rate. For productions that want to lean on ProRes's speed and quality without resorting to an external recorder, this is simply not found anywhere else. 5.7K is also available up to 60 FPS, when compressed in the MOV container. This shoots a 300 megabit per second long op HEVC file at 10 bit 420. So if you don't have the space or throughput to handle ProRes, you can still take advantage of the 5.7K resolution this way. Next up are the 4K formats. There's so many of them, but the two high-end options here are the 4K at 120 FPS option, and of course 4K at 60 FPS. The 120 FPS is limited to 10 bit 420, while at 60 FPS the camera can reach its full 10 bit 422. At 120, you're also limited to a 300 megabit long op mode, so there's no intro recording available at that frame rate. Things get very interesting though at 4K60 because the camera opens up some more recording options depending on the card you use. 4K60 is available in 10 bit 422, but it's also available in an intra frame mode. But there's more. There are actually two intra frame modes when shooting in 60 a high and a low mode. The high mode runs at 800 megabits per second and can only be recorded to the CF Express slot while the low mode runs at 600 megabits per second and is able to record to V90 SDXC cards. Scroll down a bit and you'll see that Panasonic added this same flexibility for the camera's 4K 48 FPS mode. So just about everyone can take advantage of it. All of the 4K options are also available as DCI 4K options too, with the frame expanding appropriately to cover more sensor space. Another mainstay of the GH series are the anamorphic or open gate modes. Being a 4x3 sensor, the Micro Four Thirds system is uniquely positioned to offer this, and the GH6 is no exception. Vertically, the camera's 5.8K open gate mode is actually the highest resolution mode available up to 30 FPS in 10 bit 420 with a 200 megabit per second data rate. There's also a 4.4K open gate mode, and that one's interesting in that it runs at 300 megabit per second 10 bit 420, but only at 48 and 60 FPS. Finally, the 1080p HD modes are numerous, with HFR recording topping out at a blistering 240 FPS in 10 bit 422. You can even shoot this frame rate in intra mode at 800 megabits if you desire. Let's take a look at the body of the GH6. There's not much to uh, explain that's different from the GH5, so if you've used that before, you'll be very familiar here. But for those who aren't, uh, let's take a quick look. The major change, of course, is the LCD screen and active cooling system in the back here. Um, if you've seen it before, you'll recognize it from the Panasonic S1H. It had a very similar design 
uh, where it kind of protruded out the back. This doesn't add nearly as much bulk to the camera. I think this is actually almost unnoticeable, but you gain the same benefits, which means you have the tilting and free angle screens. So you can tilt it up and out of the way of the main connections here. So you have a lot of space between the screen and the cables. The LCD is gorgeous as always, sporting 1.84 million dots across three inches. The OLED EVF is similarly reliable and bright in use with 3.68 million dots and 0.76 times magnification. There's a fan inside which draws in air from the left and pushes it out on the right so you have unlimited recording time. And in fact, Panasonic does rate the camera for unlimited 4K 60p recording up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So you have to be in some pretty hot situations to exceed that. The lock here, which is the biggest new addition that I could see, was uh, put there so that you know you can't change it. You could see it's alerting you. You might slide onto this dial and change your exposure. I'm notorious for changing my shutter speed by doing this. But other than that, you have your playback buttons, the EVF, the LCD, your autofocus to manual focus switch, um, focus modes, uh, AF on button, joystick, quick menu. The display button, thankfully, this was changed already on the GH5S, but the display button is no longer on the side here, it's down here, so you don't have to worry about your grip hitting the display on and off. And the back button. If we look at the top, there is a dial for the burst modes, continuous shooting, interval, time lapse, and the 100 megapixel high resolution stitching mode. Over here on this dial, this is the main mode dial, so your manual, shutter priority, aperture priority, uh, cinema mode, of course, it's all accessed through here right near the on off switch. You have your standard exposure dial up here, um, a record button, shutter button, which can also record another exposure dial, white balance, ISO and EV buttons. And this is probably the biggest addition right here. This is the audio information button. Now this, just really quickly, I can show you if we turn this on, you'll see that just one press brings you right to the audio menu. And you can see here which microphones you're using, what the gain is, if you're muted, if you uh, have high bit depth audio, which channel assignments you have, the monitoring situation, if you have four channel setup going on. So really cool and you just click that and you go right back. So much faster than having to dig through the menus. So then we have all of our inputs and outputs on the left side as well. We have our 3.5 millimeter mic and headphone jacks as usual. And then we have the USB-C connection. This is a 3.2 speed connection, meaning you get 10 gigabits per second, perfect for 4K video and high speed data transfer. This also supports power delivery, by the way. So you can power the camera and charge the battery, though not at the same time with a stock charger. You have to use a third party charger for that. And then we have an HDMI 2.1. This is a full size connection type A, uh, also great for external video. Now the card slot here, this is a dual setup. We have a CF Express setup and SDXC. This is UHS-2. It takes V90 cards, which you will definitely want, especially if you can't get your hands on a CF Express card. The CF Express is, of course, necessary for a lot of the very high bitrate codecs, including ProRes. You have to shoot that to uh, CF Express. And the SDXC is actually much more capable than you'd think. The front side of the camera is not too different from what we've seen. The major addition here is a front record button, which yes, can be reprogrammed to act as a custom function button. Otherwise, it's largely the same. Lastly, on the bottom, there's the battery slot and the usual quarter 20 thread, but also a new hole for tripod registration pins. So this should give you a much stronger and more easily aligned connection to your tripod plate. The battery here has changed to the DMW BLK22, which is the same battery as the S5 and the GH5 Mark II. The GH6 is in fact backwards compatible with the DMW BLF19, but you'll get less battery time that way. So just to wrap things up, the GH6 has a few other improvements worth mentioning. On the audio side of things, as you'd expect, it retains full compatibility with the DMW XLR1 accessory, but now the camera supports four channel recording by using the XLR ports on the adapter and the stereo 3.5 millimeter mic input on the camera itself. Audio recording is also improved with 96 kilohertz, 24 bit support on the XLR and mic jacks. In case you were wondering, there's no battery grip plan for the GH6, but it does have new USB power delivery options. With the standard charger supplied with the camera, you can either charge or power the GH6 via USB, but not at the same time. 
If you, however, use a third-party 9-volt, 3-amp USB power supply, you can indeed charge and power at the same time. And lastly, we've already got news of a firmware update coming at a later date. Panasonic plans to add external SSD recording over USB-C to the GH6, which is a pretty big deal since this is a ProRes-capable camera. And ProRes itself will see support extended to the 4K and 1080p formats as well. As far as external video is concerned, 4K 120p video will be possible over HDMI while Live View is active thanks to the HDMI 2.1 connection, while 4K 120 RAW output will also be possible to be used with later external ProRes RAW recorders. Wow, that's a lot to take in. I was thrilled to get my hands on the GH6, and seeing how far this camera series has come is just amazing. 5.7K ProRes is probably the biggest new feature here, but the 4K 120 and full vlog support are massive improvements that are going to give a boost to production quality and versatility for this camera. So that's it for the Panasonic Lumix GH6. I'm Doug with BH, and I'll see you next time.